All right, so we will be talking about gradient descent uh, methods, optimization methods, and a few topics related to this. The outline, so we'll talk about the concept of gradient descent, how, how it is used to minimize a function. And the second part is just to kind of set ourselves in the same, with the same name, same notation, a common, common notation. Then we'll present these algorithms, which are the most popular ones. Um, and then we'll talk about some extra uh, methods that usually come together with when optimizing using gradient descent. Okay, so let's, let's consider a function, j, from rn to r. So you take a vector of n, n entries and it will give you a number. And theta will be a vector like those in Rn. And recall that a, a level set of J is a set of all the thetas in that um, vector space, such that when you plug it in, oh, that should be J, not L. J of theta equals some constant. So each cons constant will define a level set. And we've seen this concept before. Um, if you see it in a function of two, two variables. Suppose that this is x, y, this is c. And suppose that you, for example, that, that function is a paraboloid. You'll have to excuse my drawings. I'm not very good at drawing. It's not that. So <coughs> something like this. Do you remember how the, in this case, the level set will be level curves. Do you remember how they look like? What are they? <laughs> yeah, circles. So look at the definition of the level set. It's all points such that when you plug them in the function j, again, it will give you some constant. So you kind of define the constant. So meaning, for example, the um, the input is all the points in the plane x y and the output is some the height right so you set yourself at some height c some constant h whatever and then you look around and see what points are in that at that height and the points that are giving you those outputs are the level curves so in this case in the x y plane which is uh, where the domain i mean this is the yeah, where the domain is this function, there will be circles. Maybe this is f of x, y equals, I don't know, one. Maybe this is f of x equals two. So you have an infinite number of circles, right? Here maybe you have a, a point, which we know by, suppose that this function is exactly, um, So, okay, we have the level curves. And we can, uh, we can see that in, we can imagine that in many dimensions. So for, so for example, if it is a function of three variables, the curves will be now surfaces. It's like uh, a solid with several layers, and the layers are the, the, the level surfaces. Now, the important part here is that the gradient evaluated at some point, so suppose that pick this point here, And this is the key of the whole class, of the, of the whole session today. The gradient is normal, is always normal to the level set, to the level curves. And it always points in the direction of the, the maximum rate of increase. So in this case, it's normal. And because of we know how the function behaves, we know the gradient will be something like this. But here it will be something. Now, do you, are you truly convinced? Are you, do you see it clearly that, oh yeah, the gradient is of course normal and it gives you the maximum, the direction of maximum <coughs> um, 
the direction of maximum rate of increase. Do you see it clearly? Do you believe it? Are you convinced? You are? <laughs> Everybody? Yeah. Yes? No? So, yeah. Because that, that's the key. Um, that's the key of, of using this stuff is first <laughs> believing that the, the, the gradient is always telling you that. Uh, take a simpler example. We'll come back to this, but take a curve like this in one dimension. Now this is x, y, this is just a function of one variable. So take a point here. The derivative is positive. You can see, you can picture that as a gradient of one dimension, as a vector of on, on the line, and it will always tell you, if it is positive, it is kind of secretly, secretly tell you that the gra like, yeah, the function is increasing in that, something like that, level point. So we, we see it in one variable, we're kind of convinced that the derivative here is positive, for example, here it will be negative, telling you that if you want to travel in the direction in which f increases, then you have to travel in the negative direction, right? Here it's kind of the same. This is telling you if you want to travel in the domain such that the function will increase, then travel in this direction. And you can see that if you travel outside, like so out, um, outward, this, it will the function will increase. But okay, but why is it normal? Now, bear with me just for a couple of minutes. Suppose that you have a, now a level surface, a function of x, y, c equals some, no some number c. And whatever, however this curve looks like, Maybe whatever, maybe it's the back of the chair here. Pick a point here in this level surface. Let's call it x0, y0, c, c0. And choose any, any curve that you want as long as it passes, that travels on this, that is on the surface, that passes through this point, whatever. These curves in 3D are always defined by some vector, some, 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 some parameters, imagine that the or origin is here. And this R can be, for example, it's a vector, coordinates x, y, x, y, c that depend on the parameter c. Okay, so far so good? I, am, I, am, I, am I clear enough? Just as a level sur surface, you pick a point, choose any, just some curve. You will have this point. Now, Let t0 be the point such as when that in that moment you can see t see as a time, like in that particular time, it will give you this point. So it will be, um, okay, I think that's all, that's all, that's all, that, those are all the ingredients that we need. Okay, now, the function, all these points here, when you plug them into this function big F, they give you always the same number, it's a constant. So if you take the derivative with respect to T of all these function, you'll see this T never changes. So the derivative with respect to T is always zero. And that's almost it. <laughs> 
So this is a total de derivative. F does not depend on T explicitly, it depends parametrically, right? So do you remember what do we do in order to see, to calculate this, the total derivative? The chain rule. The chain rule, uh-huh. So we have the partial of F with respect to X times dx dt partial of f with respect to y dy dt and from here this terms are the components of the gradient so you can see this as a dot product this will be in vector form <coughs> and these are the components of r prime This is the gradient. And let me now come back to this specific point. So the gradient evaluated at any point in that surface. So let me go explicitly in this point times R prime of T zero. Always here. So what does this tell us? The dot pro product between these two is always zero. And R prime, the derivative, is always tangent to the curve. Sorry? No? <laughs> Isn't there a zero orthogonal? They're orthogonal. orthogonal. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah, yeah, normal. So R prime is tangent to the curve. But imagine that the surface is the, the back of the chair. And Maybe the point is here, and this is R prime. Maybe I should that curve going from here to here. R prime is not here. All I know is that the gradient there is orthogonal, but there are so many choices, right? It could be like it could be this. It does. It's not necessarily normal to the surface, at least not yet. Do you see that? Do you know? Can you tell what? will be the last argument that tell us that definitely it has to be normal to the surface. It has to be with this ugly curve that I draw here. I draw it arbitrarily. <coughs> this works for any curve. So if you draw like curve like this, it will should work like this, like that. So R prime in principle could be the whole, like this infinite family of curves that will never end, R prime is always like this. So, and the gradient is orthogonal to all those, all those vectors. So the only one, the only vector that satisfies that is the vector that is normal to the surface. And that applies to any level set. Now, the thing about the maximum um, grade of increase has to do with the direction of derivative. The directional derivative is the dot product between the gradient and some some unit vector that you want to see how much uh, function changes in some direction, and you'll see from the expression that it is maximum when the gradient and that unit vector like are the in the same direction. So that's why the gradient determines the direction of maximum rate of the increase. Okay. Uh -huh. So the direction, the directional derivative. I don't know what. Uh, notation you use, but. Let me go back to the notation in our presentation. The directional derivative is this, and this is telling you 
how much does the function j changes in the direction that u is telling is giving you so because of the dot product since it is proportional to the projection of two vectors it is maximum when those pro those two vectors are parallel that's why this is maximum when u is in the direction of the gradient so the gradient will tell will determine that direction but also the magnitude of the gradient determines the rate of increase at that point any questions about that i know it was kind of lengthy but uh that's kind of the key the key um, concept that we will use in order to develop all these algorithms. Because once we get the, the, to that realization, so my question is, uh, yeah. the function can have two directions. Exactly. Which one does it pick? So it will be normal, but we also know that it's, it is pointing in the direction in which f increases. So for example, here in the parabola that, I, that we had, the level curves were circles, and we know it points out because of that's in the direction that f increases. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, but yeah, um, it could it could have been the the other way, right? So we we kind of needed the other argument about the directional derivative and the rate of change. Uh, okay. So, yes. You're talking about the gradient descent or yes, the. When you, when you had a diagram and you were showing the uh, x, if it's on the positive side, it's maximizing on the right hand side. Like this? Versus, yeah. So. Oh, all I said is that the derivative is telling you here in which direction f increases. Increase. Yeah. But you are, you are hitting in the, in the nail of my next argument. Okay. So we're going to use this idea in order to develop an algorithm to look for a minimizer or a maximizer, but in this case, minimizer. So let me ho hold on to that thought. Suppose that you have a level curve, something like this. Mm. I lost my train of thought. Oh yeah. So suppose that this is a minimum and that the gradient increases in this direction. I mean the gradient points in this direction. The negative of the gradient points in the direction of maximum rate of decrease. So if we're looking for the minimum, we could always solve for, um, when is the gradient zero, like I try to solve it analytically and find that point. But in practice, especially for in machine learning and complicated da data sets, it's not feasible to solve it analytically. So, so we have a method of searching, which is we're going to, going to use the gradient. And we're what we're going to do is that at this point, you don't know anything of this. You are lost in the space but you have the negative gradient of f. And it's telling you, I don't know if the minimum is exactly in this direction, but I know that if I start working, at least for a little while, I will be, f will decrease. So, but we don't know for how long that we can keep that up, right? So if you continue going here, the function will increase. So we will take small steps to be kind of cautious. So okay, we, we know that in that direction it decreases, so I'll take one step, and then I'll do again. At this point, I'll ev I will evaluate again. I find the, the gradient. Say, okay, this way, and that way we're kind of following this, uh, like a, a descent, a steeper, a steeper descent. Um, so that's how we use the gradient in order to search for a minimizer. So that's the last part. Before uh, getting to the 
algorithm, we just need to, comp this is one of the stuff that you need to do at least once in your life, that you have to at least prove mathematically that it is actual, uh, an actual improvement. We're going to take a point here, the starting point theta zero, and we're going to subtract a piece, a fraction of the gradient, okay? So we are hoping that this point, uh, uh, that at this point the function will be a little smaller. And this is what we're going to do. So we have, by Taylor, Taylor's theorem, we can expand that function j i'm going to use my french arrows here to denote vector uh, after we will not write it we'll drop it expand to as have a layer a some other terms. Okay, this is, this is the general expansion in Taylor's view. Now, in order to get to the expression that we want, um, let theta be this, the starting point, and let um, A be that other point. Oh yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. So thank you. We want this to be A and this to be A. Thank you. Um, now theta, we need also this theta minus A is just this part minus this, right? So. will be negative alpha with the gradient of j evaluated at theta zero. Okay, so now we plug in this, this, and this in here, and that's how we get this expression. Oh, but let me do one more step. So we'll have that j evaluated at this other point will be equal to Now this part, this vector dot product with itself. This alpha is just a number, so you can go out of the product dot product. And this will be just the square of the magnitude of that vector. And now that is how we get this part. The rest of the terms will have will be higher powers of alpha. So we'll denote it just like some higher order uh, terms of, of alpha, okay? Now the argument is that if you pick alpha, first of all, alpha you have to choose it for to be positive if you want this to be an improvement. So basically we will say that if alpha is small enough, this term 
will actually decrease, like it will, <laughs> this so um, how can I say this? We want to claim that uh, this is actually less than this because we want to claim that this is an improvement, this point is an improvement over this point in terms of looking for a minimizer, meaning the, the functional actually de decreases. So th if alpha is small enough and positive, first of all, it's small enough, so these terms won't contribute enough. And positive, so it will subtract some positive number out of this term. So together, this part will be less than just this term. Does that make sense? When you subtract it from the positive. Positive, so. But with the, uh, let's go back to this again. With the um, ar argument that this part, if alpha is small enough, the contributions won't, won't be that significant. So still this term will, the subtraction of this term will beat the addition of this, whatever this is. And it will be, this will be less, like this will be less than just this. All that together. Okay, any questions so far? So we kind of, kind of we see that this point here is an improvement if we're looking for a minimizer. So that gives us this algorithm. In one dimension, you'll see it very clearly. So start whatever, and suppose that you don't know the form of the, of the curve of the function. So start here, maybe this will be theta c. The derivative here is positive. So our next point will be this minus a small, a small fraction of the derivative So the derivative is positive, so we are we ensure that we're actually subtracting a positive number. So theta, the new theta one will be to the left of theta zero, right? We don't know how far it will be because it depends on alpha. So suppose that it takes you maybe to here. Now this is theta one. Or maybe I should have chosen something. But in, anyway, for the sake of the argument, suppose now that eventually maybe you go to this part. Maybe theta two will be here. So let's look at that theta two. Theta two will be theta one minus some fraction of the derivative of theta one. Oh, uh, let's look at theta two first. Grab it. At theta two, the derivative is negative. So times this negative will be adding a positive number, meaning that it will take us that way. So you can maybe now imagine that the search it might go something like like this, or let me redraw this. Maybe I have a curve like this. Maybe the search can take you like this. Depending on alpha, if alpha is very small, maybe it will take you very slowly here, like here, like here, here. The steps will decrease as we are, are approaching the minimum because the, the derivative, the gradient, are tending to zero. The derivative here, 
very, very small. So the update, the update will be very small, question. So how do we determine how, what is a sufficient HTML route? That's exactly the big question. So there are, there are many modifications and techniques in order to adapt. We call that alpha, the learning rate. So there, it's, uh, there's a lot of there's a, a lot of research about it, but it's still um, it is uh, an open research topic. So what's the usual alpha then? Uh, like point zero one, like two yeah, yeah, something something small, point one, point zero one. So sometimes you can get away with this m with greater alphas. For example, if the the function is something like this and you're very far away. If you pick an alpha very small, it will take you forever to get there. I mean, sometimes you can get away with a high choice of alpha. Uh, what you can do in practice is you can test the uh, same values of alpha, train the, same like train the same algorithm with those same values and see which one works better. And then you choose the one that works better and stick to, to that and then tune some other parameters, hyper parameters that we call. So theoretically, you reach the minimizer when all when the gradient, all the components of the, of the gradient gradient are zero. In practice, you stop whenever the cost the, the 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 function that you're trying to minimize is small enough. Small enough. You can like like it doesn't change, but it barely changes. You can graph. Usually, we graph the the function, how it is decreasing, and there will be some point in which it's like kind of reached a plateau, and it decreases, but it's so little that it's like, okay, it stops. You mean the graph of the higher dimension? Oh, it's not the graph of the function. We, of the function itself, it's the, the graph of the value of the, so the, the um, yeah, so we will, we will the construct what we will call a cost function, and the cost function will always give you an output that is a real number. And that those are the numbers that we're going to graph in, in terms of the iterations. So that output is it decreasing. So we can do it in, in one, one in, in two dimensions. Yes? It's interesting if the parabola is inverted, if it has a maxima, this thing uh, will diverge away. Exactly. And not only that, the, yeah, if it is, so we are, we are setting up everything to, to find minimums. If you want to find the maximum, just change the function for the negative of the function and then apply the same algorithm. But you can also maybe explode everything. Suppose that you pick a very huge alpha. So from here, it will take you to this point. And from here, the derivative is even greater. So it will take you to that point and it can explode. So choosing alpha is, is very important. We will see some algorithms, the most popular, integrate what we call um, adaptive adaptive learning rate that in we'll, we'll see we'll that. and also there's some we'll, 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 we'll get to it but anyway th that's a very good question um, in practice so it's very hard to actually reach to the minimum when you have a data set and the more complicated the less likely like you it's not usual that you get to zero. But that doesn't really matter because usually uh, we just care about some performance measure piece that you don't, even if, like it don't, doesn't have to be 100%, even if it is 99, it's super good, right? So even though you didn't reach the, max, the minimum, um, it's still good. And this is not part of the, the, um, the class today. But also hitting the, the actual minimum minimum sometimes is not what you want because the model will be overfitting. So we'll get to that. So it's not such a big deal. Okay, so just to put ourselves all in the same page, let's talk about objective functions of predictive models. Think about supervised um, learning in which, for example, you have a data set with m examples. So each column here with x and y, each one is an example. 
you can think of it like, for example, if you if you are building um, models to try to determine if you should approve a loan to some people or not, like automatically, this the the um, these vectors we, w we will call them feature vectors. Each entry could be a dimension. So, for example, the so like the credit credit score, the income. Another in uh, feature will be the income, the family, whatever, what they have for dinner, whatever. And this label can be, for example, zero or one. Zero is not approved, one approved, whatever. You can also, for example, have a um, picture of a cat. Right now, it's very that's the, that's the trend. That's where the big money is. <laughs> Suppose that uh, these are the pixels of the picture, and this is telling you whether yes or no is the picture of a cat. So, but we're not taking any example in particular. Just they, they take this form. We just w need the the notation. So we will call these feature vectors, in which each entry of the in this vector in one of these vectors will be called features. And we will call these labels. This is training set because you're taking examples that already happened. For example, in the loan um, and the risk of loans, like giving a loan, you already saw if the loan was approved or not. So we already have the labels. Or in the picture case, you already know if it is the picture of a cat or not. So this is training because it's already it already has the answers. Now, mm. let me first show you this picture. So this is my idea of a predictive model in a very general, general setting. So a predictive model will take, it has some function, some mapping F, some function that makes use of a set of parameters. So for example, in linear regression, the function is just linear. And the set of parameters are the coefficients that multiply each of one, one of these features to get, get a prediction. So each example passes through here, and it applies this function that depends on this theta also, and these parameters. And it will output a prediction that we will denote by y hat. Whether the, predi the um, hypothesis of the model is good or not, for now it doesn't matter. Just think that when, whenever you pass an example, it will generate a hypothesis, a prediction. Okay. And this is so the prediction will be a function of the prediction i will have a prediction for each example. And it's a function of the features, the feature vector, and also the parameters. Um, you know, let me draw this picture here. We'll be coming back to that later. This is a function. At this point, I'm treating theta. Mm, I didn't want to put it as a vector. I wanted to put it more, more like a set because sometimes it is not just a vector. Theta can be a matrix or a set of matrices. For example, the, the neural network with, one, than with more than one layer, each layer will be a matrix matrix of parameters, and they all have different sizes, so it's not exactly a vector. So, but just for simplicity, let's, let's treat it like a set of parameters, okay? Okay, <coughs> now, for each feature vector, this will output a prediction. With the training set, we actually have what should be the correct answer. So we will create, you can create a loss function that can take many shapes, but all we need is that 
the loss function characterizes how far away is the prediction from the actual label. So it's kind of a measure of the error that the model is out outputting. So far so good? And now the cost function will be just sum all the losses for all examples and average them. So we'll sum all that and divide by the number of examples. So it's just kind of the average of the loss, like the error. And this we'll call cost function. And this is what we're going to optimize. We're going to minimize this with respect to theta. Basically, we want to tweak these numbers here, these parameters. So these two together will work well, that the, the predictions will be close to the label. OK? Any questions so far? Yeah, it could be, for example, uh, the logistic regression, linear regression. The, um, just the, the F will change form. There you go. <coughs> and are we going to check? So this taking the, you saying it's taking the average? Uh huh. Still to the value of M then divisible by M. Uh huh. So. Just add all of, all, all of the, is the average of the losses, of the error. So I'll add all of them and divide by the total number of them. Total number, okay. Uh -huh. That's what, okay. Is the expected value of the loss function. Ah, yeah, I, I remember. So in reality, loss function, cost function, error function, the, all those terms are, uh, are used interchangeably. But for today, let's call that loss function, like for each example, and we will call cost function the overall cost. Okay. Okay. Now, <coughs> when you have a data set, the uh, straightforward implementation of gradient descent, to taking into account the all the ex all the training set, is called batch gradient descent because you are taking the whole batch. And let me show you the algorithm first, and let's see what each line means. So first, you decide what your learning grade will be. Maybe alpha, say that maybe alpha will be 0 0.01. I don't know, maybe it's a little small. Then your thetas, you have to start somewhere. You could set them all equal to 0, but it's not a good idea because then everything goes to 0. But so usually, we just initialize them randomly. So for example, say that theta 1, the first example is, I don't know, theta three, whatever, just randomly. Now this, we have this while here. Stopping criteria, criterion is, you can think of it right now like, okay, I'll do it 200 times. After 200 times it stops. Ideally, if we had um, infinite power over computation, we could put the criteria, okay, when the cost function is less than 0 0.001. But you don't even know if you will, uh, the cost function is actually going to decrease. So theoretically, we, we can put it like this, that criterion will be, can be something more general. In practice, it's just, okay, I'll do it 200 times. After that, just stop. Now, what we're going to do, we're going to compute all the predictions. So in this step, we're setting, we're fixing the parameters. Like we are kind of sticking to that decision. Now we're going to pass all the examples, the feature vectors, and see what are the predictions. And for each prediction, now we're going to compute the compute the loss function on how far away is it is actually from from the label, from the actual label. And from there, you, we can find the the average, right? The, the cost function. Now, the cost function is a function of theta, and 
we can find the gradient, meaning the partial derivatives with respect to each of the parameters. And we can implement gradient descent, the, this update to each theta. Let me explain this um, notation. Usually, so okay, let, we have the this repeating part here. Okay, I'm not going to write everything. Usually, you will see it like this, with an arrow. This <coughs> um, derivative. I didn't write it because I didn't want to saturate everything, but they're evaluated at all the values of theta. So it's a, an actual number. It's not an algebraic expression. So you'll be subtracting an actual number here. This, you'll see it like with an arrow like this. What this means, that the two dots with the equal sign, is like a, an imposition of assignment. Saying, okay, now your thetas in, in the code, in the code, you won't see these labels. You just have theta. Oh, this should be theta two. Theta one is this. Theta two is that. Here you'll see no, 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 no. Theta one will be now this. It's an imposition. So this is what the arrow means. Make this value your new thetas. But in mathematics, what we have, it will be that now theta one, one, will be theta one zero minus the derivative of j with respect to theta one and this is like zero and up. So meaning the next one is the previous one minus that. But we don't see it like this in total code because when you program you don't you don't keep track of these things. You just make an imposition like, no, no, your theta one will be now this, and now do it again. So this changes, it replaces this line in the repeating. So what we're doing, so we had the cost function, remember? We passed, we kind of stick to one decision. We compute all the predictions, the losses, the cost function, updated, so meaning we're going to change this, and now we're going to do it all over again. But the update is like uh, an educated, update because we're using gradient descent and eventually the cost function will decrease any questions Yeah, that's a very good question. So um, this while here, yeah. yeah while, okay. uh -huh. But this part, I put it element-wise, but we shall usually we vectorize it. So yeah, we don't do it one by one. So for example, here you can you could think that it would be for an, a for loop. But in reality, it's all is vectorized, like with matrices. So you do all of it, all of it at once, then that, that speeds up the the algorithm, but this one here, it will be a for loop, yeah. So this here is one of these, is one step of gradient descent. We're taking one step, then we'll do it again, take another step. So, so we start with theta, and we keep updating it till we reach the sum of the thetas, but theta is a vector, right? Ah, uh, yes, it could be, a, yeah, like a vector. So you will update all the entries, uh, entries of the vector. Each of them. Because uh -huh. the gradient is also a vector. So you will do it like uh, dimension by dimension. But you in practice, you do it with like vectorize all of them at the, at the same time. But conceptually, this is what you're doing, like every, every dimension. And a vector of n theta. Mm -hmm. And n theta, exactly. But for the last line that says return theta j, Oh, yeah, yeah, one to n. Thanks. <laughs> one to n. Yeah, thanks. And then my, with my, I teach Calc 3, and I, I usually bring a bag of chocolates that are typo chocolates, and whenever they <laughs> score a typo, I give them a chocolate. 
Well, I don't have them now. Um, okay. We'll take points for the final. Five points. Five points for each. Okay, now. A brief drop to the city. Yeah. <laughs> Go back to the field service again. Yeah. Where is in the computation? So theta is hidden here, right? In the prediction. It's kind of implicitly here. So if we were to actually write it by hand, you see that the thetas appear when the pre because the prediction is a function of the xi and theta. So uh, we could have written here why that this is, is a function of these two things. It will be a little too long. But in reality, here, this is an expression of xi's, the features, and thetas. But we want to take only the derivatives with respect to thetas. So wouldn't it like be that the Exactly, just that. It's just that it's kind of nested it's here. Uh -huh. Okay, now there's an improvement of, on this, especially this batch grain descent. If your set, your training set is maybe 2,000 examples, it's still okay. But even like if it is more than that, even if, for example, if you have five million, batch grain descent would be super small. I mean, super slow. So an improvement is this mini batch grain descent, which the idea is that we're going to split. So we have our training set. Let me write like this. This is my big X. So we have X1, X2. We're going to um, split this into batches of size S. So, for example, the first S example, we call it. We will call it our first batch that we will denote by big X with curly bracket. Now, the second mini batch of S example, will be our second. And maybe a, at the end, we don't know if all the mini ba the last mini batch will be the same size. If it is a little smaller, it's it's okay. And suppose that we get big N mini batches, and the labels is the same, so they're they're all they all come together. Like Y one. Sign to this future vector. So this will be our big Y curly bracket one. So we have our data set. We're going to split it into these batches. And we're going to apply the, the algorithm that we just saw. 
to each one of these mini batches. It has a few um, things to observe. First of all, look at the second line. It permutes the training examples randomly and then split into mini batches. Because, meaning, first, before doing the mini batches like this, <laughs> I would kind of went ahead, uh, ahead of myself, we want to permute all the examples to randomize, randomize. So each mini batch will be kind of a fair representation of the whole data, kind of. Because maybe your data is, uh, it has certain uh, organization. For example, the, in the loan model, maybe you, the first half is those that were rejected and then you have all the, those that were accepted. So when you run gradient descent, first you will be running the gradient descent in the ones that were rejected. So we want to permute randomly, so we want to travel the deck, right? Now, what we're going to do, this part is the same. Initialize the, the parameters randomly. So take a random choice of the parameters here. Now, we're going to run the first mini batch. Oh, yeah, so uh, also, let me, so you understand. We're going to abuse the notation a little bit, and we're going to say that x i, little x i, belongs to big x g if this example is in that mini batch. In reality, this is a matrix, this is a vector. I don't know if it's okay to use belongs to, like set notation, but let's use this so we can know that when we compute these predictions, it's only for those examples in this batch. We're going to do this part is the same, but now for G that goes from one to N, this means for each mini batch. First mini batch, do this. Then the second mini batch, we do this again. What we're going to, what we're doing, take initial choice of this, run the first mini batch, and you will have a pr some predictions here of the first mini batch, compute the loss, Compute the cost function, but now the cost function is some only over those examples of that mini batch. And we will divide by the size of the mini batch, not M now, just the size of the mini batch. So you can think of this like a more like a local global, um, I mean, cost function. And we're going to do those updates. And now take the second, uh, we're going to update this. So we have a, now our second choice, and now run the second mini batch. Do the same thing, compute the gradient, do the updates, we change this, now run the third mini batch. And this is how it works. We're going to keep track of the global cost function to see if it is decreasing. But here in this for loop, the cost function will be kind of local, only taking us into account the examples on this mini batch. Does that make sense? Okay. So, uh huh. So what main one difference? Suppose that you have a function in with two dimensions like this. Gradient descent, the batch gradient descent. You were taking all the your data into account in o before making up an update. So the update is more like, yeah, I want to know, like I need to know everything before I do an update. So the update is in a very good direction, always in the optimal direction. Right? But it's low because before taking just one step, you have to look at all your examples before doing just one, one step. This one, you're going to take, you're going to start taking steps after each mini batch. So you'll be taking more steps, but it, you're not sure if, so suppose that you're super lucky and you permute the examples and the second mini batch for the first mini batch, you have all the outliers. All the examples are super, super weird, like special cases. So maybe 
it will take you in the opposite direction of the of the minimum. So it can it doesn't th you don't have a guarantee that it will always take the optimal direction. So it could maybe do this. <laughs> and say it's here. Something like this. This distance, mini batch, in reality is a, is a case of the stochastic gradient descent. We'll see a stochastic gradient descent usually is reserved, that the name is reserved for the algorithm when you take just one example at a time. So when s equals one. But in reality, when s is between one and less than m, it is a stochastic because you're not taking the whole data. So these steps could be taking you in a not very good, good in a very good direction, but it is faster. And in average, it does take you to the minimum. Exactly. Suppose that you have a training example of five million ex like ex examples. So in batch grain descent, you have to do all the five million examples to do one, and then run all the five million and then one more. If you set your mini batch, even if it is a thousand, you're going to take in just one run of the data, the whole data, you will take five thousand steps. So even if, if some of them are not very good. 5,000 of them, in average, it will take you there, so it will take you faster. So, Gary, I put a yes. um, the sample data in the mini batches. Um, there it sounded like you were saying you, the, the, the x will still correspond to saying y, right? When yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are we taking different um, attributes? Or are we just taking different a different subset of the whole data? Just a subset of the whole data set with all the attributes. We're not taking a subset of the attributes. But you say sample, which is a very, very good word. Uh, ideally, we would like to sample a batch S examples at a time, sample them randomly and uniformly from the data set to form that mini batch. Because that will ensure that each time the mini batches are different, so it's more a little more fair. But in practice, it doesn't make that much difference. So it's kind of the same if you first permute them randomly and then you marry to a definition of the mini batch. In practice, it doesn't really m improve that much if you sample that, and it's just a, it's a little more complicated al algorithmically. But yeah, always the whole, all the features together, so maybe this yeah. will finish here in this position, but all of them together. So all the features are reflected with instances that are sampled in each batch. Uh, could you repeat that? Sorry. Sorry. So each mini batch has the same features. It's just the number of instances that are Oh yeah, 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 definitely. Uh huh. Yes. We're just changing the order of appearance of the example. Now, a stochastic gradient descent, which this is stochastic again, but the name is usually reserved when you choose the mini batch of size one. I should say. Sorry, can I ask yeah. Yeah. Sure. Absolutely. Um, before we um, back on the mini batch gradient descent, uh -huh. so one. Uh -huh. So one step into that is not going to be sampling data that has any kind of less variance or anything. It's just tuning the, the alpha term. What is what is one step in? One step of this is one update of the of this data. Okay. So you have some th set of data. So for example, at the beginning, randomly, run the first mini batch compute the gradient, and update the this. So this will change these numbers. And now the second mini batch will go through this with a new set of, of new parameters. And whenever you change this, 
the cost function, the global cost function changes, which is, it's, co it's computed, it's the only thing that changes actually in the global uh, cost function because the global cost function is taking into account all these xi's, right? Yeah. The loss function and add, add in, uh, adding those. So it just changes how much, how much portion is taken from each one of the features. So something like this. So the, se the second batch will s go through this part with the sec with the update updated the feeder. Updated feeder. So each one of these is an update on the feeder. Okay. The, the global cost function changes whenever you change feeder. Does that answer the question? Yes. Yeah. But now, since each batch in each step it's not the whole thing, like the global cost function depends on everything, but each one of these is just a part of that. So in reality, the convergence, it converge, you can mathematically prove that it converges to a neighborhood of the, of the minimum. You might not get to the minimum. Maybe you get close here, and then another step will take you far away, something like this outside. It's not never just always, always to the minimum, like batch gradient descent with a proper choice of alpha. But again, it's, it's faster. A stochastic is even faster because you do one update after one example. But you can see that it will be even more stochastic because you're doing an, ob an update oh, wait, wait. after just one example. So this four goes from one to n. So take one example, do this, compute the loss, now the cost function is just that loss. And you're going to update the thetas based on, on that one <laughs> example and you do it again. So it, you take a lot of the steps with one run of the data. Run one run of the data, we'll call it epoch. One epoch is one, one run through the data, the whole data. So, that's it. so a lot of the steps, very fast, but more stochastic. So the, the greater the mini batch is, the more the, the, op the steps are a little, the directions are a, li a little better, but it, the speed is a little, a little slower. If the mini batch is very, very small, the steps are very fast, but a little more imprecise. The neighborhood will be also a little larger. What we could do, once you hit, you're hitting this neighborhood, you could, you could start decreasing alpha, the learning rate like the steps will be smaller. So maybe eventually you will be in a smaller neighborhood of the, of the minimum. The, those are called learning rate decays. And I'll show you uh, some of the examples that uh, people use. So yeah, that's the difference between batch, mini batch, and a stochastic. Although mini batch is also a stochastic. Okay. Well, you mean when you're here, or because we never we don't we never really reduce the, the size of the mini batches during the iteration. We just select at the beginning the size of the, the mini the mini batch and then run through it. In the interview with the Catholic, you change the uh, monitor every every time. Oh, okay. But it's the opposite of the batch. Uh -huh. The batch you have to go through every Uh, okay, so sizes. The okay, I told you, you if it is two two thousand or less example examples batch is still fast enough. Larger than that, maybe you want to start implementing mini batch. Mini batch is the most popular one. So all the modifications are and, and like uh, improvements are done usually on mini batch. Okay, now the size of the mini batches. Usually, maybe between 30, 60, and between that number and 500. So a few hundred are fine. And usually they are chosen, uh, I think I wrote it here. They are chosen as a power of two. So maybe 64, 128, uh, because
somehow that, Im that wor works well with the, um, the architecture of GPUs. I don't know why, but yeah, but that's usually the, the, the choice of the mini batches. Uh huh. Or yeah, I guess it would be like the two hundred fifty-six, a power of two, yeah, yeah. like the bits. Yeah. It has to do something with the hardware that I don't really I don't really understand. Mm. Mm -hmm. If you're training on GPUs, you want you may want to choose your mini batches uh, as a power of two. <coughs> okay, momentum. Momentum uses the idea <coughs> of exponentially <laughs> decaying moving averages. This part here. This idea, we, we, sometimes we use it naturally without really s seeing a, a formalization of that idea. So for, for example, <coughs> Let's get out of these algorithms and data for just a few minutes. And imagine that you want to, you're a super bad runner. You run super slow, but you, you'll start training every day to increase your speed. And at the speed that you run, so say that the 100 meters. And you will keep a, log of your, of your of your speed say that this is your speed we'll call it here and this is the date the day the number the day number and suppose that you are really really bad so maybe at the beginning the first day you're you're running like very very slow and then you start improving a little bit, but you're tired, you don't really run that much. So it's never always only improvement, right? And over the, the weeks, you, you, your improvement might be something like this. Then you are, you become very good. And we naturally we naturally think that your average speed is improving, right? But what we mean, we don't actually mean the average like maybe here and half, right? When when you reach this part, you think of your average velocity as something else. You don't think of the av your average velocity as just summing all this and finding the, the average that maybe is here. You don't think that when you are in this day, you don't think that your average velocity is this, right? So we kind of implicitly think of uh, recent history, right? So suppose that this is when you are a professional now, and you don't want to give in your data, I mean your bio, saying that your average speed also counts in, takes into account that when you were a super lousy. Uh, so we mean some recent, recent data, right? So moving averages, exponentially graded average, averages, captures this idea into having maybe something like say is a velocity at day k plus one will be, let me choose specific number. Mm, sorry, so this will be the average. For now, average. So this is your actual velocity, but this is now 
another way of defining a, an, an average, which is an exponentially weighted average. Let's expand this a little bit to see what it is doing. So in this case, relating to what we're going to do eventually, this will, uh, will take the role of our, be our, our beta one in this algorithm. But let's see what these numbers are doing. Let me change first the order. So this was your last measurement of the velocity. This was your previous accumulated average. Define this is recursively. So this is zero point nine times. But this you can use the same recurrent relation to express what this is going to be. This is going to be zero point one times the three plus zero point nine. Like a little smaller. Time. I'm going to let me write this as a step. we could uh, again expand this. But now let me take this 0 0.1 will be, uh, it's multiplicating all of them, right? So let me take this out here, out of everything, factor that. And what do we have? So we have this, this k plus one measurement. Then we have 0 0.9 times the k now, dk minus 1 has this 0 0.9 and this 0 0.9. So it will be 0 0.9 squared. You could continue if you expand this. Can you tell me the next term? Did you guess it? until you run out of measurements, right? So it is still an average that takes into account not only, say, the last 10. It takes into account all of them, but it puts a weight on them. The farther away they are from this in time, farther away in time, the less important they, they are, like the less, the less impact they will have. So this kind of helps to have more rel like it will take the last measurement will be a little more relevant in this case for the choice of 0 0.9 it you will see that it changes uh, magnitude uh, uh, order of magnitude after 10, 10 measurements so it's like kind of taking the last 10 but again not equally it has the most recent one will be more relevant and relevance will start decreasing in time does that, does that make sense? We're going to do the same thing. Oh, before this. So <coughs> if we were to, plu to um, graph the averages as k increases, maybe at the beginning we'll start here, low, and maybe we'll make something like this. <coughs> So we use this, like 
intuitively and say that the average speed is your average speed is increasing and we don't mean this average we mean kind of the average that you're running now currently what this does um, this maybe I should have put in I'll draw the first ones are uh, these will be lines for each of these going to do just this what it what it does it kind of smooths the, the measurement so suppose that you hit your pro but then th that day uh, before you hit the running track you just um, exceeded your daily doses of your, your daily doses of tacos right and maybe you'll be here <laughs> maybe run very slow but because of the how we're setting up these averages, still the last, those all these count. So it has some momentum. So this measurement, your average speed won't go down here. Maybe it will go down a little bit, but not that much. It will damp these variations. So suppose that now the next day, after you finally digested the tacos and you harvest the infinite energy of tacos, maybe you run faster than ever. The average, the, the average, weighted average is not going to overreact. It's going to be the same. Now, how is this relevant? How how does this relate to the gradient? So, let me do this drawing again. If you, you can run rate grain descent, and maybe if you start here, maybe it will take you here, and here, and here. What this does, it damps the, os the and suppose that this is just two parameters, so this is speed of one, speed of two. So if you see the updates with, in with respect to theta 2, they all move kind of the same direction. So it will kind of accumulate. It will get a momentum. All of them agree. So it will have kind of some like a, a speed there. These ones here, one is up, one is down in the direction of theta 1. Did I say theta 1 at the beginning? Theta 2 are, are like this. Theta 1, one goes up, one goes down, up, down. But if you take the weighted average of the gradients, the gradients will damp these oscillations. So it doesn't vary that much. So you're reducing, because you can have to think of this in maybe a hundred dimensions or a thousand, right? So it will reduce the variations in like the bad variations it will damp this and also build some momentum even if you have a bad measurement you still have some momentum that it will still take you that way because it remembers the current history that it was going that way and doesn't overreact to the new new updates so this is the the idea for this this v that weighted average is a weighted average of the gradient the gradient is like our measurement here of the velocity. And maybe that wasn't a, such a good example because this is also velocity. But anyway, this V, the weighted average, the moving average is going to replace the where it was going to take the place where the gradient was. So now the update will be based on this. So the effect is something like this that's why it's called some it's called momentum and that's the only thing the rest all this is the same as mini batch the only difference is that instead of putting the gradient here we're going to be computing the weighted average which is not hard computationally because you just store these numbers and you're going to add this fraction of the of the gradient so you don't need to remember all the previous gradients you can just 
do this little thing here to the add this to the previous one, and that will be your new velocity, and this will take the place of the greater. Yes. So beta one is how much preference we give to the new system. Is that right? Beta one. Beta one. Oh, beta one. Exactly. Um, yeah. So it's how much you take, how much uh, fraction you take from the most recent, and but also from the history. So there, are, I've seen some ma some versions in which these two numbers are independent from each other. The one I learned and I did as a homework, <laughs> uh, and I've seen it way more often. I these are exactly one minus the first. Okay, so, so then I was actually wrong. In beta one is how much preference you give to the historical. Uh -huh. And one minus beta one is how much you do from the greater. Any other questions? Does this affect your dot sizes at all? Like uh, is it computationally uh, more difficult because you're having to keep control of your short-term memory of the recent mm. example? Uh, to my knowledge, no. It's no, it doesn't. Have, they are totally unrelated, so it will be equally fast. I mean, not equally fast, but yeah, I don't think it makes much of a difference. Okay, so the next one, next one, this is very popular, RMS prop. So it uses the same idea of weighted um, averages, exponentially weighted averages, moving averages, uh, but in a different way. So before you, before we read this thing, Imagine, let's imagine one shape. So you can see that this is uh, an exponentially weighted average of the square of the gradient. And this number, we're going to take the square root of this number and divide this. The effect that it has, and we'll repeat this, <coughs> is that the learning rate, this is kind of a, the new learning rate is kind of personalized for each direction. So this is kind of, this is going to rescale the alpha in each differently in each direction. And why is that useful? So suppose, I cannot draw in 3D, but suppose that you have a function that in x on this plane looks like But not this function. Now take it out of the board. And it will be this. Take it like this. But it's going up a little, little, little by little. So like a water slide that is con going that way. OK? And there's a minimum here. Now take, so is this water slide? Suppose that your starting point is here. The, the uh, derivative large, considerably large. So the steps will be will be large going down. But in this direction, this is, 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 is very, very little steep. The steps, the derivative in this, are this direction are very slow. So this maybe will converge very fast, or it could even explode. If, if you, for example, if alpha is small enough, maybe this will converge. But it has to be small in comparison to the, this derivative, but that will be that will set the alpha very small, and the once you hit the bottom of the water slide, it will start coming here super super slowly. But if you do the other way around and say, okay, let me choose a higher alpha, so this will be a little faster. Maybe this will explode. So what you do is say, okay, I'm going to do adaptive learning, an adaptive learning rate. In each direction, it will be different. And this is what what this is this algorithm is doing. This this is uh, from the family of adaptive learning rates. Al adaptive learning rate. So what this is going to do? So you are here in this point. The derivative is really large in this direction. Very small in this direction. So what you're going to do is compute this part. If the derivative is really large, this number will be very large. 
So this will be very large. You will be dividing by a large number, so it will decrease the learning rate. And the opposite holds. If this is very small, this will be very small. This is small, so this will be very large. So it will rescale. So it will, in this direction, it will, the learning rate will be, it will decrease the learning rate. Okay, I will have to be more careful. But in this case, and like, oh, the derivative is so small, it will increase the learning rate so it, it converges faster. So it's kind of customizing the learning rate in each of the dimensions of theta. Does that, does that make sense? And we're going to do the same thing. We're going to accumulate this as a moving average. So you can take into account the recent, his, uh, recent history. And, and that's it. So we're going to, don't do, do not look at this alpha yet. <laughs> I mean this epsilon. So this SJ is going to be up, going to be here. In order to avoid division by zero, we're just going to add a very small number. Small constant. Usually, it's ten to the negative seven, ten to the negative eight. So we just don't have division by zero or something like this. So it's for numerical instability. But this is what it is doing: it's personalizing the learning rate in each direction. And the reason is it has a square here is because you don't want to take into account the sign of the derivative. You don't want the direction. It doesn't really matter. All that matters is um, the magnitude. Because if this is negative, you don't want to be subtracting here <laughs> something and it's getting smaller. So you need something that is consistent, like you just want the magnitude. But having the square also has the effect that if it is very small, it will make it even smaller. If it is really large, it will make it even large. If it is kind of one, it will maintain it kind of there. So that's why we have the square and not just the derivative. Any questions? So if there are no terminal, uh, no condition is defined, it's going to add average every time, right? So we add epsilon here, which is just a small constant. Usually epsilon. No, I mean, I, oh. I, I get that. So the only thing is uh -huh. it needs to add that constant when it's sj is zero. No, you always add it. Oh, OK. So it's always there. Okay. So you don't have to be it's looking. The equation, that's what I was yeah, exactly. Okay. No, it's, it will always be there. And it doesn't really affect, it's too small that it won't affect the updates. But it's, it's large enough so your program won't um, get under in definition than the division by zero. But if it's a larger value, will that average is going to skew the results though? If S sub J is large? No, it's fine. If this is large, very large, it means that this is very large. So you want to decrease the learning rate because it could explode. So you want to decrease the learning rate. That's why we divide by the square root. I mean, the, yeah. the magnitude. So this, the, magnit the, the order of magnitude of this is kind of the order of magnitude of the gradient. Uh, RMS stands for root mean square. So first, we, we're going to take the root of some mean average of the square of the gradient. But yeah, so if this is very large, it's because this is very large. And this also, the history is very large. So the, it has a history of having large derivatives. So you want the learning rate corresponding to, in this, to this theta j to be smaller, to take smaller steps, so it won't blow up. Does, does, does that help? Imagine that you're running rain descent. This one, this it will converge here. But suppose even if you reach the bottom, this is 
so little steep that the step will be very, very small. So this one converges very fast, and it will be just waiting for the other one to, to take this small step, small step. So yeah, th that part of the graph was kind of in, the, in my imagination. <coughs> okay, Adam, the Adam algorithm is a combination of momentum and adaptive learning rate. That's the, the usual implementation is just the combination of those two. The original algorithm includes these two terms. Instead of Bj, of the velocities, it will be this corrected Bj. Those are, co those are uh, called corrected bias. So what they are, so going back to our example of, of our training, like running training, remember we had something like this. And the curve, if you notice something that I haven't, I haven't been pointing out, we set, we initialize the velocities to zero and then we start accumulating. Also the same for these decaying terms like Sj. And so we start at zero. It means that here in your first measurement, your average is zero after you, after this, and then here. So you see that it will always be kind of low, showing lower, and then maybe it will, will get decent. But during the first iterations, it is undershooting the real values. So what we we're going to do when we divide the bj by t is the number of iterations. And so, for example, in our in, the, in our example, we had 0 0.9, and this was a uh, In our example, it was something like this. So first of all, you can see that when t is really large, this, is not, this number is very, very small. So as t increases, you'll be divided by one. So basically, it will, the, the effect will disappear. But at the beginning, say when t equals one, this is 0 0.1. So it will rescale the first one like really large. So even if you start zero, maybe it won't do anything. <laughs> but the next one definitely will, it will kind of try to correct it. But it will, that effect will, disap will be vanishing because it is a part of a number that is less than one. So this is what they mean by corrected biases. So since we are taking weighted, like moving averages, we can correct these terms with these two things. So at the beginning, it's a more, a f more fair um, estimation of the average. In practice, so it looks like this. We have the momentum uh, terms, the terms for the correction of the learning rate, and we correct both. And we substitute these corrected versions in, in here. In practice, um, these weighted averages, after 10, suppose that this is the uncorrected and the corrected maybe is here. After maybe 10, 15, 20 iterations, they look pretty much the same. So it just, it just matters at the beginning. And since we usually take a lot of iterations, it doesn't really matter. But the original algorithm has it, and some, uh, some people still use it. Maybe if, you don't have, if you're not going to do many iterations, it's um, maybe a good idea. And that's basically it. Any questions? Okay, so the learning rate decays. Um, so we, we said that after, after some time, we could start decreasing the learning rate in general for all dimensions. And these are four ways of that you can do it. So T is the number, the epoch number, meaning when you run the data, you run through the, through, through the whole data once. 
that's an epoch. So it's a while while loop uh, outside in our algorithm. You can divide by some fraction of that. Gamma is a decay rate. You can even set it equal to one. So you'll be dividing, so set the learning rate, initial learning rate to some number, maybe 0 0.1, 0 0.3. And it will be decreasing each time, each iteration, each running through the data. So it will be decreasing this learning rate. Mm -hmm. And all of them are have the same effect. As t increases, it will decrease the whole thing. All of them have the same, the same thing. Gamma is usually less than one, so in here also it will decrease that. Uh, having adaptive learning rates like RMS prop is a little more usual, especially because they are implemented in many of the libraries, for example, Azure, uh, TensorFlow, PyTorch, uh, Keras. Uh, all the deep learning libraries have this. Uh, you can choose those algorithms, and you just have to choose the hyperparameters. So you have to know what thing does what. You can always choose what other people did, and that's usually a good idea, a point to where, uh, point you where you can start. But you, the better understanding you have about the algorithm, the more chances you have to tweak it a little bit. And it's good for culture, even, I even though you can do it ju by just um, calling a, a command, it's good to have the culture and understand what they're doing. Okay, penalty methods. We can approximate, so we have that constraint problem, optimization problem in this one. We can approximate that problem by adding, uh, we can convert it into a non-constraint problem by adding a penalty on, on theta. This penalty function kind of penalizes the farther away theta is from the feasible set, the greater the penalty will be. And this will be will, will freak out because it's like no, I'm trying to minimize it, so it will try to to make the penal the penalty function small. So it will add the, so indirectly it's trying to satisfy this constraint, it's trying to bring theta to the feasible set. So the definition of the penalty function basically is three conditions: it has to be continuous, it has to be non-negative, and it will be zero whenever or if and only if theta is in the feasible set. You don't want, you don't want it to be zero in some other point because then you, you run the risk of not satisfying the constraint at all. And the minimizer will be happy because it's still minimizing the function. So, okay, all of these, these make sense. The most common uh, example is regularization. So we call this L1 regularization when you the sum of all the absolute values of all the entries of theta. L2, so that's the L1 norm. L2 norm is just the regular norm that we, we know. It's just the sum of the squares. <coughs> L2 is a little more common. The difference is that L1 is it has an effect that some of the thetas will be zero. So they make it makes it sparse. And okay, first. Can you say that again? Hmm? So this label that I, I wasn't writing before, this is just to denote the type of norm. So L1 norm is denoted like this. L2 norm is denoted like this. We just take the square of it. So this is a square, this is a label. The squares with a one half in front of the oh, good. Uh, they didn't ask me that before. It's because it's just a com you don't need it. It's just when you take the derivative, because you're probably you're going to do the gradient, that two will cancel with two. But it should work even without the one half. So we usually add these two terms to the cost function. So I w the cost function that I was showing you. It's not the usual cost function. At least you will have this regular regularization. But it, the algorithms are the same because if you see these functions depend only on theta. They don't depend on the training example. So it doesn't matter if you have mini batch or batch or whatever. This is always the same. Okay, so what are these terms doing? So 
to this v, the larger the theta, the thetas are, the greater the penalty. So w the minimizer, if you try to minimize this, it will try to bring the thetas to closer to zero, negative or positive or closer to zero. So it brings the whole theta vector closer to the origin. So it will be a little tiny vector. So what do, why do we want this? Suppose that you are going, going to do a polynomial fit of some data. There are some structures like, for example, that deep neural network that are, ver uh, ver that are very powerful approximators, meaning that they can resemble complicated functions. So if you give them all, like you build it very deep and you give them a lot of liberty, maybe they come up with a complicated function like this that overfits the data. passes through all of this. So there, there are models that, that can do that, like they can overfit a lot. So, but you want this, but this is probably not a good hypothesis, right? Uh, it doesn't look like it's that complicated. Maybe you want something like this, maybe like a cube will be a, a more reasonable hypothesis. If you have something super specific to the data, we call it overfitting. So if you have a new point, suppose that a point here, or yeah, even here, V should be like very close to the hypothesis, but it's kind of far away from the red line. It's just like overfitting is not good. So what this is going to do, the thetas, if you keep them small, you're kind of limiting the power of the approximator of the model. And these curves, if this is a polynomial, if the thetas are the coefficients, the curves, the homes will be very smooth. The changes cannot be like super drastic. So it will try to, it will make it, try to, it will have smooth homes because the thetas are small. So that's the kind of the effect that regularization can have. So it reduces overfitting. And this might be a better generalization. It can gen maybe generalize it better to new inputs, to training, I mean, to examples that the model <coughs> hasn't seen. So that's how we implement um, penalty functions. It, the difference is that, suppose that you have just two parameters, and look at the level curves of this function here. The level curves But you want them to be small, so maybe, maybe just one. Two, I don't know. The curves of this. I'm going to drop the one half for now. These are circles. Or radius, or square root of two. So you, if you remember, for example, the Lagrange method, we were the candidates for minimizer for critical points were the points where the level curves of f, maybe if f co is coming here like this, where they share a point and maybe they have the, they share the tangent line. 
when this um, I suppose that uh, doesn't matter so <laughs> and we don't, don't have that much time F you think of this remember in high dimension maybe a hundred dimensions so this will be also spheres of a hundred dimensions it's kind of likely because of the this is sharp La it's a little more likely that the functions will touch the corners first. And the corners, for example, this one has this feature equal to zero, right? In these corners, one of the features equals zero. Here, this is a only this, but this is kind of equally likely to be hidden than to a point, say, here, because they all have the same shape, just because of the sharpness that they have here. That's why it make, makes it more sparse, and some theta will be zero at, at the end of the training. So the so people use it to compress the models, to say like, oh, the theta are, are zero, we just drop them and we don't even include them, so we don't care about those dimensions. But it's not that common anymore, I think, to my, to my knowledge, because there are other ways of doing, doing that without doing this type of regularization. So L2 regularization is a little more common at uh, GD. Any questions? Okay, so last part, computation graphs. This is just one example from my mind because I thought it was, it's easier to see it with, a, uh, with an example than to uh, explain the definition in, in sentences and kind of in general. It is just that diagram of kind of flow diagram that this depends on these entries. So X1 and X2 go both to here and this is just a function and also depends on these two. And now this takes these two values, A1 and A2, and calculates, it also uses these two and has a function G. And that, that function G and the fact that this, uh, this F is here and is the same F here, is just because of my example. This could be F1 and F2. It could be with no F, just the sum of them. It can have, it can have all, uh, like infinite possibilities, maybe just three theta, one, one, times X1, whatever, whatever you want. I just use the general functions here. The um, computation graphs, the idea of having like a, let's call it a terminal function L here, if we want to minimize it with respect to the theta there, I just put them outside because of the, our drawing here. What we need is the partial derivative of L with respect to those parameters, right? So let, let's do one. Let's do So whenever you have like a, a computation graph like this, you can optimize, you can minimize that L using gradient descent. Suppose that you want to find that partial derivative. How do we find it? So the functions are nested, right? Are it's like a, a composition of functions, yes? Chain rule. Chain rule, uh-huh. So we can take, L does not speak to theta two one directly, but it has some other spikes, right? That do speak to theta two one. Particularly, we can see from the graph that only A two speaks to theta two one, right? Oh, yeah. One. Yeah. So, in principle, we should have all, like with respect to theta one, with respect to a one, with respect to all of the terms that we have there. But let's just do this. We know that before that we had a one and a two. So let's find d l with respect to a a one and a one with respect to theta two one plus partial of L with respect to A two and partial of A two with respect to theta two one. Yes. I have a little bit to do here. Is um 
theta, theta two one is not in a one. Ah, exactly, exactly. So this will be two. I just wanted okay. to write it so we can do we don't forget it because maybe so this can have any shape. So maybe theta two one also goes here. So then we we'll have to take also the derivative with respect to a one. That's the only reason I, I did this term. Got it. And okay, so only this term, right? Only a two communicates to theta two one. So L is that G function. So it will be the derivative of G with respect to a two. And that a two is that F function with respect to two one. How do we find this derivative, the first one? What is the partial of g with respect to a2? Theta 2. Just that? So let me ask you, if you didn't have this, this g, that would be the derivative, right? But doesn't it make a difference to have a g that is applied to this? Uh huh. So chain rule. <laughs> so chain rule. I don't like the, the the concept because it's just taking the derivative. We always de take derivative. We always derivate using the chain rule. So we have to take the derivative of g prime. Uh huh. And now the second term. Partial of f with respect to theta two one. <coughs> so the x1 prime, x prime, exactly. So that would be in a particular example, suppose that, suppose that f is sine or tangent or the exponential <coughs> or whatever, and these thetas will be actual numbers, like theta 1, 1 <coughs> equals 3, and maybe this equals 1, this equals 0 0.5, whatever. So this will eventually will be, it's evaluated at all the parameters x and all the parameters, parameters theta. So it, has, it will be a number. So okay, the message is that we can find these derivatives in this computation graph. So we can use gradient descent to minimize this function with respect to the parameters. And why is it relevant? The, it is, this is relevant because a neural network, the computation graph. Probably you've seen the, the drawing. This is connected to this layer like this. And there, there's another layer, layer, whatever. Then you have a cost function at the end that is dependent on all the previous nodes, which is the same thing here. It just has a different, different shape. In the neural network, these are the x ones, and the weights. We don't see them. We are, they are like here. It's a matrix of parameters that are assigned to this. So they come from above. That's why I like to draw it like this mentally for me. Because the neural network, you don't see these weights. They are just a different layer like in here. They multiply the features and then a function is applied to them for like a ReLU function or a tan H or sigmoid function. So basically, I mean this, <coughs> when you do updates, you don't get in the sense that you update the parameters using this, this is what is called back propagation, which is the, 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 hard, the hard part of ne training neural networks, or the hard theoret theoretical part. But it's not that, that hard, it's just the chain rule. This is composition of functions that are nested, so you have to compute all the derivatives in this way. The back propagation starts from the cost function of going back, or starts from so suppose that this this ends in some hypothesis, whatever, and this goes to a, a cost function. You can you can find the derivative of this cost, func cost function with respect to each weight at each layer, all these weights. 
and you're going to use that, those weights, I mean those derivatives, to update the parameters. That is what is called back propagation. Forward propagation is just inputting this layer of features and do the calculations, whatever output it is, that's forward. Backward, back propagation is finding, like updating the parameters using the partial derivatives. And since they are nested, you have to do changes. So it's kind of back propagating. You're kind of seeing how much does L changes with respect to this part. So basically you're saying, okay, if, you, if I move, if I change this a little bit, Using that, I know how much this will, will change. So you are seeing how much theta two affects this. The I mean the last function l. I don't know. Th does that help? Yes. Definitely. That that's back propagation. You will you'll be hearing ab about that a lot. I guess. And okay, so the final part is so which algorithm do we choose? There is no consensus. So all of the ones that we saw here are extremely popular. Um, RMS prop is very, very popular and also Atom because of the adaptive learning rate. But also just a stochastic grain descent or mini, like mini batch is uh, used a lot. So I took this literally from the Ian Goodfellow book, literally, the statements here. And he says that it seems like the choice of which algorithm to use at this point seems to depend largely on the user's familiarity with the algorithm. So you can tune the hy hyperparameters better. So the, the one that you understand better and you're more, more familiar with, you are a little more propensed to, to use that. And that's it. So this presentation is a combination of my own little ideas and some statements taken literally from these sources. So Chong, the Ian Goodfellow book, and this course from Andrew, Andrew Ng, Andrew Ng. <laughs> it's a very Do you have any practical examples of this applications that currently uses these type of algorithms when you look at them like in that perspective, what is how the variables and how the uh, algorithm is used, how the computation will actually works when you have a matrix that's given. Do you, do you know any like practical examples that he currently uses? Or I could provide some links if you want. I'll send them to Dr. Montiel. Um, I, I don't have any with me here. So basically it's, it's a, I have the link on my computer actually, but it's hard to do this in, uh, in the board in the examples, right? So it's more like you, you'll show the implementation of that in code. And I do have, like there are tons of, of examples of this because they're extremely popular. Okay, right. So. What algorithms, uh, what we will provide for you are problems. Uh, problems with the solution. It will consist probably of a, a Lagrange problem, a KKT problem, one of the Riley quotient problems, and a, um, one of these gradient descent problems based on everything based on what, what I've already assigned to you and given to you as examples, and then in the gradient descent, what will be hopefully 